Hello, I'm Lucy. And I'm Michelle. Welcome to another episode of Tudoriferous, the biographical podcast that examines lives in the Tudor era. And today, someone I'm excited to hear about, like really excited. Hmm. Princess Margaret Tudor. So you should be. Oh, so really? You should be. I, I think this story could be written as a novel. I'm, probably somebody has, but I don't read historical oh, novels. Yeah. So. But yeah, it's a perfect story. It's got pathos, pride, moments when it looks as if it all was going to go so well and then doesn't. Oh. And, and it's got a proper baddie that you'll hate. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, I mean... We thought uh, Catherine Gordon could pick them. <laughs> oh, no. Nothing compared to Princess Margaret. Did she pick the one? Wait, she picked one of her husbands? I know she got married more than once. but Yeah, I... she picked two of them. She obviously shouldn't pick James. Yes. Which was a pity because he was the best of the bunch. Oh, no. <laughs> and he didn't want her. Oh, we're getting too far no. ahead. <laughs> yeah, we are. Because first of all, we have a few new patrons to thank. Oh. Our Tudor Roses, Sarah Willers, Melinda Haunton, Amayi Morales, I hope I've pronounced that right, Julie Walton, Golan Bitten Yarowski. They've offered to be our Jewish advisor in case we're baffled by anything, like we were constantly in the Pico de la Miranda yeah, episode. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah. And Flo. Hello. Flo's a very good name. My cat's called Flo. Aww. So it's a good name. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank That's you. That's really yeah. helpful. All of our research materials aren't in it print. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> it really is very helpful. And, of course, you get extra episodes. Yes. And if you're a noble or a monarch, you get even more extra episodes. Yes, and you get to vote. Vote, vote, mm -hmm. vote for who we cover mm -hmm. in our Patreon episodes. And the next one we're doing is Moctezuma. Moctezuma! I got a lovely book about him. Oh, Absolutely good. beautiful book with lots of lovely pictures. Awesome. And we are clear across the planet this time. Yes, we're out of Italy at last. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. We haven't fully covered Italy because there's a few more people that we want to cover, but yeah. Yeah. And this is a person that I have no idea any information about him whatsoever. No, interesting, interesting, a lot of background and an interesting man. Okay. And much liked, even by the Spaniards. Anyway, that's nothing yes, to do with Margaret. nothing to do with Margaret. <laughs> Let's get back to Margaret. Well, I think she deserves more of the limelight than she gets because she was the daughter and sister of a king and the wife of a mother of a king. Yes. So oh, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Although isn't that normally what princesses end up I suppose so, yeah. Yeah. I was just bigging her up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't need it. And it's a, definitely a story of two halves. So we, we, are, we, are, we are having two episodes. And I, I'm not going to split it where I wanted to split it. I wanted to split it after the Battle of Flodden. Okay. But then we get two very lopsided episodes. We get a shorter one now and a very long one. Right. <laughs> so I've had to shunt it along a little bit. Um, and the second part of her life is a lot messier than the first. So, we haven't done this for a while. Come with me if you will. In fact, this was a last minute thing because I'd completely forgotten about <laughs> it. <laughs> but none the worse for that. Come with me if you will to the shrine of St Ninian. Pilgrims struggle barefoot to venerate the saint. Some are lame, some are obviously ill. Some gather sickly children in their arms. All hope that Ninian will be able to cure them or at the very least alleviate their suffering. The roads are rough and muddy. They are footsore and exhausted. Suddenly, a noise from behind them. Coming through, get out of the way! The pilgrims shuffle to the side of the track and stand amazed, as first a coach trundles past, in which sits a young girl swathed in costly fabrics, and then cart after cart after cart after cart of the young lady's possessions slithers through the mud, splashing the pilgrims as they go past. The lady sticks her head out of the carriage. Yes, get out of the way, you lot. I'm on pilgrimage. What? <laughs> <laughs> in a carriage. In, in an actual carriage. carriage or in a litter? Uh, I thought it was a carriage, but the important thing is she has a lot of possessions with her. Okay. We don't, I don't think we have full carriages yet in England. Oh, oh maybe you do in Scotland. Possibly. 
I don't know. I thought, uh, maybe I assumed carriage. Don't know. Mm. Even worse if it's a litter because you've got people lugging it. Yes. Slipping in the mud. We've got to look up when carriages come into play. Because yep, I know okay. Elizabeth I was carried in a litter when she was young. Carriages weren't a thing yet. I know she went on um, pro- procession with a carriage. Yes, when she was queen. Hmm. hmm. I hmm. don't know. Well, more questions than answers like the rest of this podcast. Yes. <laughs> If you know, let us know. Margaret is born on the 29th of November, 1489, at 9pm. We know the time? That's awesome. Well, quite often they knew the time because they might want to draw up horoscopes. True. Later on. So oh, right, to and she is a moment. royal, so she's more important. Yes. Okay. Her parents, in case you need to get your bearings, were Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth Woodville were in attendance for her birth. Of course. <laughs> yes. Shoving each other out of the way to get, get to the front. Yes. She, she was baptised on St Andrew's Day, patron saint of Scotland. So a bit of foreshadowing oh. there. <laughs> to the sound of trumpets, which must have terrified Terrifi- the poor little mites. <laughs> was that how they got them to cry instead of smacking them on the bottom? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> She wasn't born to the sound of trumpets. She was baptised to the sound of trumpets. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> yeah. Margaret Beaufort took on Margaret's day-to-day upbringing. It seemed course. a little presumptuous to me. <laughs> <laughs> she took on everything. Yeah, she's got a mother. Yes. Her first public role was in 1494, so she'd have been nearly five, when she gave out prizes at the joust. Oh. She must have been very sweet. Oh, that would have been so cute, unless she's throwing mm. a tent temper tantrum because she doesn't want to give the prizes yes. away. They're mine! <laughs> <laughs> I know a few young kids that are like that. <laughs> yes, the ones that hog the, uh, the, the parcel and pass yes. the parcel. Yes. <laughs> the marriage negotiations with James... We went straight into marriage. The marriage negotiations with James IV of Scotland started in 1495. So that's two years before Henry VII was going to send an army up to Scotland but got waylaid by the Cornish rebels. Oh. So it does show how very up and down the relations between the two countries were. Yes. Henry's councillors weren't happy with this idea. They, weren't, they, didn't, they didn't like the idea of Scotland. But Henry said, quote, Supposing that all my male progeny should become extinct and the kingdom devolve by law to Margaret's heirs, will England be damaged thereby and not rather benefit? For since it ever happens that the less become subservient to the greater, the accession will be that of Scotland to England and not of England to Scotland, unquote. So presumably that's what his councillors were afraid of, that England would sort of disappear, would become greater Scotland or something. Right. And wow, talk about seeing the future, though. Because he is great grand. Is it grandson or great grandson by that time? Ends up being the king of England and Scotland. I'm not sure. There were more generations in Scotland, Scotland than there were in England. Great grand. It must be great. It's got to be great. But would it have been that easy, or would there have been such bad feeling between the two countries and those circumstances that there'd just have been all out war? I don't know. Anyway, Henry seemed convinced enough to offer his daughter. Also, we know that he was being prodded in the back by Ferdinand. Yes. So if you don't offer James Margaret, then we'll offer him Catherine of Aragon. And you wouldn't want that, would you, Henry? <laughs> <laughs> and later, another daughter that doesn't exist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As you say, James was none too keen to marry Margaret. Yeah. And it's nothing against Margaret herself. I mean, by all accounts, she was all right. Yes. Well, he wouldn't have seen her and he wouldn't have seen no. any of the Spanish princesses either. It's entirely how much money and power can he get out of this marriage. Yeah, well, also, he wants heirs, and it's going to be many years before Margaret's in a position to right. do her duty by yes. heir, by bringing heirs, because she's still just a little slip of a thing. Mm-hmm. In 1497, James IV and Perkin Warbeck invaded England, and as we know, this didn't go down well with Henry, and so the marriage was beginning to look as if it would never happen. And as the Cornish rebels marched closer to London... Since, as you'll remember, Henry had to abandon the Scottish campaign to sort out the Cornish problem. <laughs> yes. Henry took his family, including Margaret, to the safety of the Tower. So that's where she is. It's funny. We have this 
complete view of the tower being this horrible dungeon, and yet it wasn't. It was such an opulent palace, too. Yes, imagine. Yes, it's uh, a lot of it's going to be extremely sumptuous. Yes. Mm. But not the bit that Paul Perkin ended up in. No. In September 1497, the Treaty of Ayrton was signed between James and Henry, and Pedro de Ayala was sent to England to extend the truce to the lifetime of the longer-living monarch plus one year. And he never came back, much to the infuriation of de Puebla. <laughs> If the truce collapsed, Spain had said that it would mediate between the two parties so that they could make sure that their daughter was moving to a peaceful country. Right. Henry was worried about concluding the marriage treaty at this point. Margaret was seven. Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth of York were pleading with him not to send her to Scotland yet. And Henry told de Ayala, quote, The Queen and my mother are very much against the marriage. They say that if the marriage were concluded, we should be obliged to send the princess directly to Scotland, in which case they fear that the King of Scotland will not, would not wait, but injure her and endanger her health, unquote. But it happened to Margaret. Yeah. Well, she wasn't seven, but still. Mm. So she knows. Yes. But it's a horrible thought for any father to have to face, isn't it? Yeah. And he told de Puebla, or de Ayala, with the Canada roles, you know, that use of he all the time, it makes yeah. it, sometimes it's confusing who they're talking about. Yeah, which one? <laughs> yes. Quote, she has not yet completed the ninth year of her age and is so delicate and weak that she must be married much later than other young ladies. So you're telling him that they're giving him a delicate and weak girl? That doesn't yes. seem like a good <laughs> a negotiation. <dud> one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thus, it would be necessary to wait at least another nine years, unquote. So he's oh. talking about, 1718. Yeah. yeah. Good for him. Mm. But he may not have needed to worry because James had many mistresses. Yes, that was the reason for the concern. <laughs> including his favourite, Margaret Drummond, whom de Ayala reckoned he'd secretly married. Oh dear, another Margaret? Yes, I'm afraid so. Why would de Ayala think she had, they had married? Uh, it's quite possible. Really? They had, yeah. So he'd be a bigot. Bigamist. He might be a bigot, but he's also oh. a bigamist. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know which one's which. Okay. Wow. But no, he's not. For reasons we'll come to in a little while. Okay. And also, um, James had a nursery full of illegitimate kids, so <laughs> he probably had enough to keep himself occupied until Margaret was old enough. Yeah. Wow. Princess Margaret. Wow. <laughs> Papal dispensation was needed because it always is. They're related in some way. They're distant cousins, but that's enough. Uh, Alexander VI said yes, quote, as a, as a gift of special favour, unquote, which probably means that Henry slipped him a <laughs> pound or two. <laughs> but first there was Arthur and Catherine's wedding to get through. Prince Henry and Princess Margaret showed off their dancing skills together. Oh, right. Yeah, until Henry threw off his gown like John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever and, quote, danced in his jacket with the said Lady Margaret in so goodly and pleasant a manner that it was to the king and queen great and singular pleasure, unquote. Aww. Hmm. So just bear in mind that here is Margaret celebrating the wedding of her sister-in-law, Catherine, because we may have to think about their relationship a little later on. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Sorry, foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. <laughs> Special guests at the wedding were Scottish ambassadors, including the Earl of Bothwell, who had rejected Lady Catherine Gordon in favour of her sister. Oh, poor. Well, it depends. Was he a, was he a nasty person, or would she have been better? Off? Well, of course, she would have I been don't... better off with him. <laughs> Except, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. Marriage is a dodgy situation for every woman woman at this time, isn't it? Yes. Luck of the draw. The negotiations for Margaret's marriage were concluded on the understanding that the wedding would not take place before September 1503. And that's when she's nearly 14. So obviously some sort of compromise has been found. Mm, that's still found. so young. Mm. Her dowry would include Linlithgow Castle and Stirling Castle. She would get a yearly income of £500 and would be given 24 English servants. 
Plus, James would have to pay for, quote, the apparatus of her body, the ornamenting of her residences, her vehicles, stud, furniture, utensils, food, dress, private and domestic affairs, and all other things whatsoever necessary and becoming the honour, state, rank and dignity of the said Lady Margaret, unquote. Wow, you really see the difference in the power of the countries in that treaty. Well, James got 10,000 quid. Yeah, that's nothing. <laughs> that's nothing. That's absolutely yeah. nothing. And the first instalment of that was going to be going up to Scotland with Margaret. Did Henry pay the rest of it? Oh, he did. Oh, really? And I think I think he was making a point. <laughs> yes, I can do it. Ferdinand yeah. may not be able to, but I can. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is this is all that's required. Twenty <laughs> fourth June, fifteen o two, the marriage treaty was signed, and the next day the ceremony took place with the Earl of Bothwell standing in for James, and Catherine Gordon was there, and being the only Scot, she was given precedence. Aww. Or. I wondered maybe she was needed as an interpreter. Right, they weren't speaking English yet. Well, not I wasn't thinking just that necessarily, but if Londoners and people from Kent couldn't understand each other, what hope of yeah. Londoners and people from Scotland? <laughs> <laughs> Margaret was asked by the Archbishop of Canterbury whether she came to the betrothal of her own free will. And she replied, quote, If it please my lord and father, the king, and my lady mother, the queen, unquote which is debatable as whether that could be said to be of her own free will. No, it doesn't sound like it. No. That evening, as we heard in Catherine Gordon's episode, there was a feast and a banquet. Margaret was allowed to sit at the top table with her mother now that she was betrothed. And her brother Henry threw a tantrum because he wasn't allowed to sit there. (laughs) (laughs) Of course he did. Yes, the first of many, I think. (laughs) The following day, there was a jousting tournament, at which one of the competitors was one Charles Brandon. And more about him in Margaret's sister's episode. I didn't realise Charles Brandon was so much older than them. I assumed he was the same. Yeah, that's true. Because if he's yeah. Henry's age and Mary's age, Mary's younger than Henry, then he would yeah. never have been in the joust. He would have had yeah. to have been 16 or 17 because they had to wear the weight of the armour and they knew not to pile that onto children. Yeah, wow. I'd always assumed that they were, that Henry and Charles were pretty much the same age. So did I, but that's not possible. No. Well, learning lots of things. And meanwhile, up in Scotland, James was building her a palace. Really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Anyway, remember that mistress I mentioned? Yes. The day Ayala thought James had married, yes. Margaret Drummond. Well, she died. Oh, well, if they were married, it doesn't matter anyway. Of poisoning. What? And it may have been food poisoning, since she and her sisters sat down to a meal and they all died. Uh. Or maybe the sisters were collateral damage. (gasps) Oh, goodness. How many enemies did she have? I don't know, but if James had married Margaret Jarmond, she would be a bit inconvenient now. Oh, no, are we speculating that James took out his own wife so he could marry a... Okay. No, there's never any thought it was okay. James because okay. he was absolutely devastated by her death. Oh, that's sad. At the same time, it's like, well, it's a good thing you're out of the way then because otherwise he would never fall in love with this new one. I suppose. It's a bit uh, drastic. <laughs> Poor yes. Margaret Drummond. Yeah. Uh, At least he doesn't have to try to remember to call her by the right name. No. no. <laughs> I think at this time, if you just shout out Margaret at the moment of passion, Everybody you're probably on a fairly safe bet. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> In April 1504, Margaret would have learnt, this is a sad bit, Margaret would have learnt that her brother Arthur was dead. Oh, yeah. Catherine of Aragon returned to the court where she spent most of her time with Margaret and Mary. Arthur had particularly remembered Margaret in his will... And he left her jewels, plate, gowns. However, when it came to her claiming them, her loving brother, Henry, put as many obstacles in her way to getting them as he what? possibly could. Which what we'll find that we'll jerk. see later. Not now, obviously, because he's just a little boy, but later he definitely uses them. Why didn't she get them now? Not sure. Maybe these things take a while. Weird. And just before Margaret was due to leave for Scotland, her mother went into premature labour. Oh. And she gave birth to a little girl, Catherine, but died a few days later. 
and the little girl also died. Oh. Margaret Beaufort got on with Margaret's <laughs> Princess Margaret's trousseau. And on the 27th of June, Henry accompanied his daughter as far as her grandmother's house, uh, well, house palace <laughs> in Collie Weston. The family spent a few days there and then Margaret went on alone. Well, not alone, but without her family. Yeah. Henry gave her a book of hours in which he inscribed, quote, Remember your kind and loving father in your good prayers, unquote. And later in the book, he wrote, Pray for your loving father that gave you this book. And I give you at all times God's blessing and mine, Henry R., unquote. You think Henry R., note, not dad. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when uh, Maximilian wrote to his daughter, he signed it Maxie, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah. No, you get Henry R. from Henry. Yes. Incredibly formal. Mm. The Somerset Herald, John Young, or Yonge, not sure how you pronounce it, wrote a list of all the people who accompanied the princess and everything that happened each day. So there is a lot of information about it. None of which I'm going to include here because it doesn't really move the story forward okay. at all. <laughs> <laughs> Except to say that one of those accompanying her was Lady Catherine Gordon. I missed that in her episode. Oh, so did La Wait, did Lady Catherine Gordon stay with her in Scotland? Because I thought she came... For a short while, but okay. they all came back, yeah. It was a very slow-moving procession with people lining the route almost all the way. And it took a month to get to Scotland. When they reached York, the procession was so big that a hole had to be knocked through the city wall to allow more, more people in. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's that easy? You're not very well defended. <laughs> no. <laughs> Henry Percy accompanied them along this bit with his entourage. Not our Henry Percy. His father. He'd been beaten to death 14 years ago. So, yeah, he's the son. Or the father of the other one. Uh, yes. <laughs> We've got two really important Henry Percy's and a nobody in the middle. And this one. <laughs> yes. But the one thing we do know about him was that um, when he came to leave Margaret, he did it in, he made it look like high Soho silver away because he made his horse rear. Rear. Yes. <laughs> his arm up went right. <laughs> so that's all I know about him, really. He's a bit of a show off. <laughs> hilarious. On 3rd of August, she reached Dalkeith Castle, where James did a Henry VIII and surprised her by riding out to see her before the appointed time. And he'd spent a fortune on Parisian wedding clothes, but the chivalric creed stated that the man should rush in as if he'd been so eager to see his bride that he didn't even give himself time to change. Right. So he was in his hunting clothes. And this was a lot more successful than Henry VIII's attempt with Anne of Cleves. Thank goodness. Yeah. He liked the look of Margaret even though she was around the same age as his eldest daughter. Ooh, that's creepy. Well, they had a nice supper. Margaret danced before the king, which I guess wasn't as creepy as it sounds. <laughs> 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 then the king left, and that, the evening was somewhat spoilt by fire breaking out in the stables and killing two of Margaret's horses. Oh. And she was devastated, but that gave the king a chance to come round the following day to offer his condolences. And they played the lute and the clavichord together. So it all sounds rather lovely. I'm sorry, I'm still upset about the horses. Yeah. However, when he'd gone and her ladies asked her what she thought of him, Margaret replied that his beard was too long. The following day she entered Edinburgh, riding pillion behind James, which was the Scottish custom. Isn't that a... that's a custom in a lot of places. Was it? He ride pillion? Yeah. Our Margaret of Burgundy, that we talk about stamping the foot, she wore pillion behind the Earl of Warwick. All oh, right. Mm -hmm. Well, she's pillion behind James. Okay. As part of the celebration, a deer was let loose. Oh, dear. And then the hounds were let loose. Oh, no, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> no. And they chased the deer all around Edinburgh until <sighs> it made its way back to Holyrood, terrified and exhausted. Where it was given protection. Oh, well, it was just Hours still. of entertainment there, watching a terrified deer. Oh, no, thank you. No. 8th of August, the marriage took place, and James had his arm around Margaret's waist during the ceremony. And I assume that's not usual, since people saw fit to mention it. Hmm. Then they went back to their own chambers for a banquet, separately. 
And Margaret just had the Archbishop of Glasgow, Robert Blackadder, and some other nobles for company. I'm sorry, there is an actual Blackadder? It's not just fun? There's a place and there's a person. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, They have between 40 and 50 courses, which just sounds exhausting, doesn't it? Yeah, how long would that take? One. One is enough. (laughs) I like dessert, so I'm gonna go with two. <laughs> uh, no, I've no, I've not, I've got sweet tooth, so no, just one fine for me. <laughs> um, James had the Archbishop of York and the Earl of Surrey, so it's curious to think that James and the Earl of Surrey, and that's Thomas Howard, would later meet each other at the Battle of Flodden. But at the moment, they're sitting next to each other, Having enjoying their time. M- mammoth dinner. <laughs> and later, the two parties came to de- came together for dancing. And more feasting. Oh, my goodness. Oh. The wedding had cost £6,125. <laughs> it's a lot of money. Bitten quite a lot into his 10000 Yes, and that's more than she's going to get annually. Mm. It was customary for the Queen not to show herself on the day after the wedding night, so James sent a musician to play under her window. Aww. And the following day, he does. You, you get a lot of that. These sort of little moments where he seems to have been quite thoughtful. Yeah. Hmm. The following day, he went to visit his wife, and she had a surprise for him. The Countess of Surrey, with a pair of scissors in her hand, to cut the beard. <laughs> to cut the beard. <laughs> she was firm even at that age. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. From far from being annoyed, he just sat there and let them cut it off. Oh, what a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, in all the pictures I've seen of him, he is clean shaven. So it's obviously he took that to heart and thought, well, she doesn't like it. Yeah. I won't have it. And they do seem to get on really well. But you have to sort of pinch yourself to remember, yeah, she's 13. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's very doubtful anything happened that first night. And it seems that James accepted Henry VII's reservations about the young marriage because their son, James, wasn't born until 1507, which is four years later. Yes, but that doesn't imply that it didn't happen. It could also imply that her body wasn't ready. Let's let's say it didn't happen. It didn't happen, yeah. 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 The fact that he's willing to cut off a beard makes me think that he's willing to wait. And he's got other fish to fry. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Margaret wrote to Henry, quote, For God's sake, sir, hold me excused that I write not myself to your grace, for I have no leisure this time. But with a wish I would, I will with your grace now, and many times more when I would answer, unquote. So, so I didn't quite understand that. She's sort of saying, oh, it's all, I'm just so busy. I just don't have time to write. <laughs> We're also saying, but I wish I was home. <laughs> so, I mean, she's, she's been kept busy, but yeah, she's homesick as well. Yeah. And life is really hard for these noble girls packed off to marry complete strangers, isn't it? And possibly never seeing your family ever again. Mm. Well, certainly not seeing a dad. Yeah. Sorry, Henry R. <laughs> <laughs> Most of Margaret's retinue were returning home, so she was surrounded by Scottish servants whose accent she could barely understand. James did her best to entertain her with jousts and hunts and dancing. And they were entertained by James's fools, Curie or Curry and Daft Anne. Oh. Hmm. But he had a job. He was king, so he couldn't be entertaining her all the time. When they set out for Linlithgow Castle, James had a surprise for her. He had one of the facades built in the English style so she'd feel at home. Oh, wow. Hmm. Yeah, he's quite thoughtful. He really is. And they spent a lovely few days there on the banks of the loch. Yeah, he wasn't a bad catch. I mean, he's so especially far. since he doesn't appear to have tried his passion for dentistry. So that's good. Oh, I forgot about that. He could speak French, Latin, Flemish, Spanish, Italian, German and Gaelic. He was the most multilingual king. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, he was very interested in the new learning. And one of the first things he did on becoming king was to establish the University of Aberdeen. He was into architecture, art, poetry, science and chivalry. And whatever we may have said about the Spanish court, it wasn't nearly as bad as Dea Ayla made out, despite the awful beer. 
All right, he may have overthrown his father in a coup which led to his father's death, but he uh -oh. did wear... He did wear an iron belt around his chest for the rest of his life to show that he was very, very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good enough? I don't know. Yes. What can you do? I mean, he's dead. I mean, you can't bring it back. <laughs> However, the poet Dunbar complained of the licentiousness of the Scottish court, which must have been quite a shock for Margaret after her dad's court. Right. And you wonder how much of this licentiousness could be laid at De Ayla's door. And how Is much he responsible for most oh, of it? Oh, gosh, yes. And how much of it was so visible? I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. It does seem to be a sort of court of two halves, really. It's, you've got all the intellectual stuff, and then perhaps there's an after-hours court. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the lighting has dimmed. <laughs> yes. Then they moved on to Stirling Castle and Margaret came down to earth with a bump. Uh-oh. This was where all James's illegitimate children were housed. <gasps> oh, dear. Which meant much, really, because that's one of the castles that Margaret had been given in her marriage contract. <laughs> it's, her, it's her castle. And James seemed thrilled to see the kids. Well, now she has plenty of people to play with. Yes, I suppose so. But apparently Margaret was in a foul temper after that. And sort of who can blame her? Mm-hmm. It must have been a huge shock for her, because up to now, she's got this lovely husband, showers her with gifts, built her a castle, and he's showing all the hallmarks of loving her, and yet he's had all these children by, with other women. And what she didn't know was that James was still seeing at least one of those women, Janet Kennedy. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But I suppose when you contrast it with Catherine of Aragon's experience at the same time and Henry's court, you know... Take the rough with the smooth, really, don't you? Yeah. In March 1504, Margaret was crowned. Just prior to this, James's brother, also called James due to some very unimaginative parenting, <laughs> died. And he had been the Archbishop of St Andrews. So now there was an opening for a suitable candidate. So a wise, grey-bearded man, knowledgeable about the Bible, steeped in the law of the church. Oh, please don't tell me it's John Knox. No. It's James's illegitimate son, who's just 11 years old. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, although I don't think that's worse Probably John not. Knox. At least mm. not for women. Well, it's certainly not a bad decision by James, since it meant that all the revenues that went with the post went straight to the crown until his son was 27. Right. What Margaret thought of one of James's illegitimate children being given a prominent post, we don't know. Probably not happy. He was a clever lad. He'd been taught for some of the time by Erasmus. Mm. But, but he was just 11, so. James's father, James III, had been castigated for not taking enough interest in the rest of the kingdom outside Edinburgh. But James IV was different. He travelled around dispensing justice and he disguised himself so he could mix with people and find out their opinions. <laughs> really? I thought that could go either way, really. Either he's doing that so he could hear, oh, no, they're not satisfied with that. I must reform it. Or he's saying, sort of, ha, got you. I'm yeah. the king. <laughs> hmm. I presume the, f the first. I'm hoping. Hmm. He went on penance and he visited holy shrines. And Margaret preferred to stay at home while he did this. She also preferred to stay at home when he visited his mistresses. Well, yeah, I would too. <laughs> I'd also tell him to stop if I loved yeah. him. If I loved him. Do we know if she loved him or not? Do we have anything? Um, I don't. We don't know. I didn't come across any actual documentation. Hmm. But she must have thought I could have done worse. <laughs> yes. Maybe. She had for her hand. <laughs> yes. In June, Henry sent the next instalment of her dowry with a note to Ferdinand probably saying, yep, yeah, this is how it's done. Yes, I, I follow my obligations. Uh -huh. James continued to shower gifts on Margaret with the result that wherever she went, she took cartloads of possessions with her. She was also given two lovely presents by Sir Andrew Barton, who was pretty much a pirate. Well... He was a pirate. <laughs> In the form of two Moorish girls who'd been snatched from a Portuguese vessel. Uh-oh. 
Mm. Margaret more or less adopted these girls and looked after them, calling them Margaret and Ellen. It seems a bit much to call them after yourself, but anyway. <laughs> Who became known as Black Ellen, which she must have loved. And Ellen, in particular, became Margaret's friend and confidant. So, a sort of happy ending to a truly horrible story. Mm. I mean, presumably they were on this Portuguese ship as oh, slaves. slaves. Right. And they ended up in the Scottish court as a friend of the princess. As long the as queen, the, the queen. queen could keep them safe. I'll tell you now, I won't hold you in suspense. We don't hear anything bad happening to them. But would that even be published? Hmm. I don't know. You seem to be seeing the... I, I've sort of seen these things as the, the happy side of things. <laughs> you seem to be thinking, seeing the uh, possible disasters. With the, Well, with the slavery, I've just been... <clears throat> Watching documentaries on slavery at that time, and it was horrific. So yes, mm. well, they're out of it. They're with Margaret. Okay. Around this time, James employed a black drummer, and he bought him a horse so he could travel with him. And I looked it up to see if this man predated the more famous John Blank, who was one of um, who was said to be one of the earliest recorded black people in England since the Roman age. And he was a trumpeter in Henry VII's entourage. Oh, okay. But in fact, John Blank predates him by three years. So John Blank still wins. <laughs> <laughs> in May, Margaret found that she was pregnant and she was 16. I mean, too young by our standards, but we've certainly come across worse, haven't we? Yeah. In August, Henry paid the third and final instalment of the dowry. Wow. So there we are. That's that done. Without any fuss. Well, so at least we don't have her feeling like her father doesn't love her. Mm. And this was a great help to James, who was fitting out a fleet. And he called one of his new ships Margaret. And he also commissioned the Great Michael, which was to become the biggest ship in Europe. OK. Margaret must have been terrified at the thought of childbirth after what had happened to her mother. No kidding. Mm. Yeah, being royal does not prevent you from... Mm, mm. No, in many ways it's worse, isn't it? Because there's too much interference. Mm -hmm. But on the 21st of February, Margaret successfully gave birth to a little boy whom they, after much deliberation, decided to call James. But then Margaret became very ill and it was thought she would die. James set off walking on pilgrimage for St Ninian's Shrine, which probably helped him, but I can think of ways that he could have been more help to Margaret. Which shows how much I know, because <laughs> as soon as he knelt at the shrine, she got completely better. Really? Yep. Really? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> James was much more pious than Margaret was. She often skipped services. And when James urged her to do penance or go on pilgrimage, she was never all that keen. Really? Well, she didn't have the added incentive of having a mistress near St Ninian Shrine, I suppose. <laughs> and she did go on pilgrimage to St Ninian's, as we've seen, not as James had done on foot. And she went in her carriage and she took 17 cartloads of processions. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so this is that I'm on pilgrimage. Yes. Mm. The Pope rewarded James for his piety and sent him a diadem and sword and a sort of I'm the most pious king badge. And remember that for later, because at the moment, he's in the Pope's very good books. OK. That implies he's not going to be in the future. <laughs> in July, James held a jousting tournament to celebrate the birth of his little boy and Margaret's recovery. And Black Ellen was the Lady of Honour, and all the knights jousted to protect her, which I really, really? hope was a nice thing to do and not done for, a, you know, unpleasant reasons. Oh, see, you went I somewhere I didn't go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. When I read it, I thought, I really hope it means that she's been completely assimilated into the court and everyone that would just be treats her. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. A mysterious knight won the tournament, and when he whisked off his helmet, oh, it was the king all along. Oh. And everyone said, well, look at that, we had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> In October, Margaret was pregnant again, which must have filled her with mixed feelings, especially since in February 1508, her little boy James died. 
Well, get used to that one, I'm afraid. Soon after, a certain Thomas Wolsey turned up in Scotland. Really? Hmm. A couple of Scottish nobles had been found wandering around England without permission, and Henry had had them arrested. One was sent home, but the other one, the Earl of Arran, was being held hostage, and James was not happy about it. Yeah. Yeah, Wolsey had been sent to sort it out, and he said that it was just a little bit suspicious and it would put the peace treaty in jeopardy. James said he knew nothing about it, didn't know what they were up to, but they were Scottish citizens and so the, the hostage was to be sent home. And this isn't entirely true. The two nobles had, had been to France, as James knew full well. Wolsey agreed to send in the Earl home, but he would have to sign a commitment to return to England if he were needed to answer any questions. James said he would have him hanged rather than for him to be an instrument of the English. Oh, I'm sure he loved that hearing that. <laughs> yes. No, no, I, I don't no, want the hanging. No, no, please, no, please, no. <laughs> Wolsey wrote back to Henry that he had, quote, encountered such inconsistency that he could not conceive what report he could or should send back, unquote. And James finally told Wolsey that he'd be a good son-in-law if Henry would be, quote, loving, kind, like a good father, unquote, and the Earl of Arran was sent home. So this was the first time that Margaret had been piggy in the middle between her adopted country and the country of her birth. And that's, that's her role. I know it sounds yes. awful, but that's what they were there for. Mm. And she was going to have to get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> The French wanted the old alliance renewed and sent ambassadors to Scotland. Can they have the old alliance renewed while she's married? he's married to an English woman? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Wolsey may have been given the cold shoulder, but not the French. Of course not. Black Ellen was dragged out again to be the Lady of the Honour at the tournament, and there was feasting and dancing. Interesting. I wonder why her on both occasions. Mm. And why not Black Margaret? I don't know. That's the only Didn't thing like I can call her so we can split her apart. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> there, in fact, there was too much feasting and dancing for one of the ambassadors who sadly died. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Margaret was worried that if her father heard, heard about the French visit secondhand, he'd jump to all the wrong conclusions. Well, are they wrong conclusions? I'm not sure. So James wrote him a full report and Henry sent James some horses and James sent Henry some horses, so essentially they Maybe swapped horses no. and everything was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then in July, Margaret gave birth to a little girl. And she was very ill again, and the little girl died. Oh. James took Margaret to Falkland Palace for six months to recuperate both physically and mentally. And that wasn't the end of her sorrows, for now we're in 1509. And in April, her father died... And then someone else Margaret had been very close to died in that year. Gosh. Margaret Beaufort died on the same day as James signed the Treaty of Perpetual Peace with Henry VIII. <laughs> really? Perpetual Peace? Perpetual I love Peace. I so optimistic. Yes, yes. Well, I think the, this treaty might have come from Margaret herself. Um, because she was very keen that her brother and her husband should get on, obviously. Oh, OK. Hmm. Margaret sent her brother a letter of congratulations when she heard that Catherine of Aragon had become her sister-in-law again. So that's nice. I mean, she really got on well with Catherine. Yay! Yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret was pregnant again. James was worried for his wife and went on pilgrimage, which did some good since she she didn't die. But a few months later, their little boy Arthur did. Oh. And now she did become pious because she was terrified that her half-hearted approach to religion had caused her children's deaths. Oh, right. Mm. And in 1511, she went on a, on a pilgrimage, a proper one, not just a jolly under the, under the guise of a pilgrimage. OK. And St Andrew Barton now comes back on the scene. That's the privateer who had given Margaret Black Ellen and Mar mm -hmm. the other Margaret. Don't tell me they gave him Black James. No, 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 no. I thought his name rang a bell and I looked him up. In the John of Denmark episode, we heard about some Scottish pirates that John hired to harass the ships of the Hanseatic League. Yes. Yeah, and well, that was him. Andrew Barton. That's him. Oh, so he's... Small world. He got... Where? In my head, I'm just like, so he actually got them by being paid to go get them. <laughs> really? <laughs> Well, he'd been up to his old tricks again and had looted a Portuguese ship. 
but this time the goods on board were English. Well, it was just off the Kent coast and Barton's commission had been to protect Scotland, so it's hard to see how he's protecting Scotland off the Kent coast. And Henry VIII sent the Howard brothers, Edward and Thomas, to sort it out. And Thomas, incidentally, was married to Elizabeth Tilney. And ages ago, someone asked us to do an episode yes. on Elizabeth Tilney, but we couldn't find enough information. So just to tell you, I, I'm afraid I can't remember who you were. We, <laughs> we did look. We did look. <laughs> we will try and do a cameo on her at some point, okay. if there's enough information for that. Anyway, there was a proper sea battle between Barton, in the pay of James, and the Howards, under Henry. So this could get nasty. Quote, fight on, my men, Sir Andrew said. A little I'm hurt, but not yet slain. I'll just lie here and bleed a while, Ugh. and then I'll rise and fight again, unquote. Well, Barton was captured, and he later died of his wounds. And James was furious when he heard and accused Henry of breaking the treaty. This is the Treaty of Perpetual Peace that we mentioned five <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Henry said, and I have some sympathy with him here. Quote, it did not become a prince to levy the breaking of a treaty against another prince for bringing a pirate to justice, unquote. Mm -hmm. And Henry didn't kill Barton's men. He just gave them 20 days to get out of England, saying, quote, if I had shown justice instead of mercy, Barton's men would have been as dead as Barton himself, unquote. Ah, uh, true. Yeah, so there's nothing more infuriating than being forgiven when you think you're in the right anyway. And James did think he was in the right. And he redoubled his effort to create this mighty navy headed by the great Michael. Which was so great, apparently, that it used up all the wood in Fife. Wow. Yeah, I don't know whether Fife was a particularly wooded county, but... Uh, yeah. And the ship was going to take 300 sailors to man her. And when you think John Cabot's boat only held 18, this is yeah. a big boat. Yeah. It was twice, twice as big as the Mary Rose. Really? OK, that's a surprise. Guess what Henry thought about that? Margaret was pregnant again and probably could have done without the added strain of her husband and brother at loggerheads. But she was taking things very easy. She was just watching all the extravagant partying at Christmas instead of joining in. Aww. But also, she probably didn't feel like joining in. She'd lost a brother, mother, father, grandmother and three children, and she was still only 22. Yeah. In fact, she'd lost a few siblings, hadn't she? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, quite a tragic start to life, isn't it? Henry now joined the Holy League, and that's Ferdinand, Venice and the Pope against France. And Scotland had the old alliance with France. James was beginning to panic. He'd been sent a message from the Pope, declare war on France. And this was the Pope, and James was very pious. Yeah, but it's the old alliance, though. Well, he tried to sue for peace. And he got Margaret to write to Ferdinand. You know, you don't know me, but I'm the sister-in-law of your daughter. Can we just talk it, talk it through yeah. <laughs> and not go straight to war? But Margaret went into confinement at this time. But she'll be OK this time because she had the girdle of Our Lady. Oh, of course she's going to be OK. Well, we yeah. know she's going to be OK. But it's amazing that you can think that something is going to keep you alive that has absolutely nothing to do with the process. In my mind, I just can't reconcile it because I don't have those same beliefs. Well, remember the Virgin Mary ascended to heaven and threw her clothes down as she went. I mean, <laughs> it's got to work. It's got to work. <laughs> and then it was pounced on and cut into lots of little pieces. <laughs> oh. Margaret gave birth to a little boy, another James, and he was a weakly little specimen. But Dad, King James, threw a lavish banquet, which included wild boar, oxen, 17 calves, 94 pigs, 35 sheep, 36 oh lambs, gosh. 78 kids and 250 birds. And 78 kids is baby goats. It's not baby actual goats. children. <laughs> <laughs> and you wonder if James is sort of overcompensating. He must think this, you know, the rest have died. This one's a sickly little specimen. Oh, yeah. Let's just eat, drink and be merry. I don't know. Tudors seem to have a lot of problems having children. They do. You know, Margaret didn't, didn't attend the banquet. She'd just given birth. She's hardly going to be shoveling away 78 kids and 250 no. <laughs> birds. <laughs> English ambassadors arrived and Margaret was thrilled to meet them and get news from home. 
Unfortunately, the news from home was that her brother had declared war on France. Oh, goodness. And the ambassadors had been sent to check that England and Scotland, you know, were OK, aren't we? Are we OK? But the negotiations quickly declined and ended up with each of them saying, and another thing, and another thing. Uh-oh. It wasn't looking good. Margaret, who, I must admit, I felt she was a little bit frivolous at times. Really? She seemed much more interested in her inheritance because she'd been left all that stuff from her brother. And she still and hadn't she's got gotten stuff it. from her father and her grandmother. No. When was Henry going to send it to her? But I guess that's better to focus on than the death of your children. Yeah, it's just, but it seems like quite a trivial matter compared to the political situation between France and England and Scotland. True. But James saw it as a snub from Henry. And so that joined ah. in all the other and another thing. Uh huh. Margaret gave birth to a little girl at the end of the year, prematurely, and the girl died. But little James is still alive and, and had become a robust and healthy little chap. So they have got a child. A. Out of all the, what is it, five she's had so far? Yeah, gosh. Four, four or five. Makes me wonder if it wasn't Catherine of Aragon's problem. Makes me wonder if it was Henry's yeah. issue. Oh, right, so it's... It's the Tudor line that has trouble breeding. You assume that with Margaret not being as pious, she's not doing all the fasting that yes. some of the others did. Yes. Hopefully. Yes. When an English emissary arrived in court, Dr. West, Margaret was thrilled to see him and asked for news from home, adding, quote, that she trusted that Henry had not cast her away, so little had he written to her since his coronation, unquote. Oh. Hmm. Dr. West told her that Henry was readying ships to sail to France, but what was worrying him was that Scotland might invade while he was busy in France. The doctor asked Margaret to mediate between the two and persuade her husband not to do anything rash. And she said, yeah, 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 she'd do what she could. But more importantly, where was that damn inheritance? <laughs> I understand there might be keepsakes and things in there that she wants. She's far from home. But you can imagine Dr. Dr. West saying, didn't you hear me? I'm pleading with you not to let James raid England while Henry's away or there'll be war. Yeah, so give me my stuff and I'll do what you ask. <laughs> yes. But in fact, she was onto something because Henry had told Dr. West to use the inheritance as a lever or bargaining tool. Oh. Tell her she can have all the stuff if she tells her husband not to invade England. To which, ah. to which Margaret apparently replied, quote, and not else, unquote. Yeah. And by that, she means what? Nothing more? She means, what? Well, I don't, if I don't ask him, I don't get it. Oh. <laughs> oh. Hmm. All she's got to do is ask. James called Henry's bluff by telling Dr. West that he was damned if he was going to have his wife's possessions used in this way, and he'd give her the equivalent of the inheritance himself. West asked James for an indication about what he planned to do in Henry's absence, to which James shouted, quote, you know my mind, unquote. West replied that he neither knew him nor his mind, which is quite ballsy for a mere emissary to say to a king. Yeah. Yeah. Margaret then wrote to Henry to say that if she'd known it was going to cause all this trouble, she was sorry she'd ever brought up the subject of the inheritance. And she also thanked her brother for apparently having been concerned to hear that she was ill. Although amazingly, she doesn't add, but it was too much effort for you to write and tell me so. Yeah. Yeah. Your brother is awful. <laughs> Bizarrely, West then asked James for the loan of the great Michael so that England, England could use it against the French. What did he think James was going to say? Yeah, yeah sure, take it. <laughs> the audacity of that. Yeah. Yes. Then he tried bribing James... And then he said, I hear you want to go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Well, you're not going to get there without England's help, are you? What? Which is true. Why? Because as we learnt in John Tiptoff's episode, the crews to the Holy Land left from Venice and they were in the Holy League. Ah. Uh, yes. <laughs> the cruise to the Holy Land. Yes. <laughs> it is not a cruise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It makes it sound so benign and so many people <laughs> die doing it. Yeah, that plague-ridden, pirate-infested cruise. 
Then Dr West went home, taking with him presents from Margaret to Henry, Catherine of Aragon and her sister Mary. When West asked what she thought of the situation, she said, quote, I'm sorry it's not more favourable, unquote, which I should imagine she was. James only wrote one letter to Henry, demanding Margaret's inheritance. Of course. Who, quote, for our sake, gets not her father's legacy promised in our diverse letters. Ye may do to your own as ye think best. She shall have no loss thereof, unquote. On the 30th of July, Henry left for France, leaving Catherine of Aragon as regent. And he left the Earl of Surrey, that's Thomas Howard, on keep your eye out for the Scots duty. Howard was fuming about this. He wanted to do the proper battle against the French. Okay. And here, he's, he's relegated to a sort of home front. And he muttered to himself, although I can't imagine how anybody knows this, but anyway, quote, Sorry, may I see him, James, ere I die. That is the cause of my abiding behind. If ever he and I meet, I shall do all that lies within me to make him as sorry as I can, unquote. <laughs> So remember that when we get to the Battle of Flodden. <laughs> he is very happy, obviously. Yeah. James received a letter from Anne of Brittany, the subject of several fascinating Patreon episodes. Yes. Tudoriferous Patreon. Cool, fizzing, and so refreshing. Saying, quote... Take but three paces into English ground and break a lance for my sake, unquote. And he was a sucker for all that chivalric stuff. She even sent him some chivalric tokens, a ring and a glove, and more to the point, 14,000 crowns. The reason I'm sorry, nobody can see my face. I'm puzzled. Chivalric tokens. I haven't heard of that before. Are these set items that are expected? Well, yeah, women gave men gloves and sleeves and things, oh, didn't they? But okay. so I, I've, I don't know whether it was the Damsel in Distress Act of Anne or whether it was the 14,000 crowns, but James immediately wrote a declaration of war. Wow. Margaret was terrified and she pleaded with him to change his mind. Quote, you have not reason to assist the French. You have to keep your promises to England and enjoy peace at home, unquote. And she was contemptuous of Anne of Brittany, asking James whether her letters would, quote, prove more powerful with you than the cries of your little son, unquote. <sighs> and James wrote to Henry, it was war unless Henry stopped attacking the French. The Pope threatened to excommunicate James and the entire Scottish nation if he invaded England. What? So f really? Yeah. Well, he's in the Holy League. Oh, yes. And they're all against the French at the moment. Sometimes they're all against the Venice, but this time they're all against, against the French. The French. <laughs> so from that special papal hat and badge and sword to a threat of excommunication. So by invading, he was endangering not only his own soul, but that of all his people. Margaret started to have portentous dreams. James yeah. falling from a great height, his bloody body full of arrows, her jewels turning to tears. Is that actually portentous or is that just, I'm anxiety ridden? <laughs> I should think it was. Yeah, she's got a lot on her mind. <laughs> but even the dreams didn't work. So she said very sensibly, quote, It is no dream that you have but one son and him a weakling. If otherwise, then well happened unto you, what a lamentable day will that be when you will leave behind you so tender and weak a successor under the government of a woman for inheritance a miserable and bloody war, unquote. And she definitely has a point. <laughs> but none of this was working. So Margaret staged a little subterfuge. She got an old man to dress in, a blue, in blue and white robes so that he looked like the depiction of St. John in the chapel where James prayed. And he came forward and held up his hand and declaimed that James must not go to war. And then he added as an afterthought, Oh yes, and you should avoid commerce with women too. <laughs> <laughs> avoid prostitutes. Well, just the mistresses. And it's as if Margaret had thought, 
well, I've got, I've put you in the blue and white robes. You know, you might as well do <laughs> in, what I need you to. <laughs> yeah, in for a penny, in for a pound. Oh, but it does show she was severely disturbed by the presence of all these mistresses. <laughs> Well, James might have been taken in, but that bit about the commerce of the women must have roused his suspicions, I think. <laughs> Wait a oh, second. yes, great saint, I will do it. And uh, hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret then offered to be a human shield. She asked to go with her husband, assuming that the English would treat her more kindly than they would him. And her idea was that she'd meet up with Catherine of Aragon, they'd talk about the old days, and it would all be over. And we've seen on a couple of occasions women getting together and bringing what seemed like an impossible peace. Yes. Margaret, Margaret of Austria and um, there's Isabella and the Portuguese, her Portuguese aunt, I think it was, wasn't it? Yes. James made a will and made Margaret regent. Now that's important. He made her regent as long as she remained a widow. Ah. That's it. Should she become a widow? I mean, we don't know. Yes, but they also, they often... All of them made wills if they were going yeah. off to battle. You yeah. just, it's something you did. Yeah. Yeah. She went with him as far as Dunfermline, and then he went on and she went back to Linlithgow Castle because she was expecting another child. Well, I think we'll probably do an episode on the Battle of Flodden, either in this series or the next. Next. Probably next. <laughs> Edward Hall, the chronicler, wrote, quote, The battle was cruel. None spared other and the king himself fought valiantly, unquote. After just three hours, the Scottish army had been demolished. <gasps> and you can never be sure of these statistics in these things, but the English were said to have lost 1,500 men and the Scottish 10,000. And included in that 10,000 was James. De Ayla had said of him, quote, He is not a good captain because he begins to fight before he has given the orders. I have seen him often undertake most dangerous things in the last wars. I've sometimes clung to his skirts and succeeded in keeping him back on such occasions. He does not take the least care of himself, unquote. Ah, so unlike Henry VII, who sat in a tent. <laughs> mm. Oh, he's in there. And he was meant to have been killed making a last-ditch attempt to get to the Isle of Surrey. Wow. But that does seem to be a bit of a trope whenever a king oh. is killed, isn't oh, it? Yes. His yeah. body was unrecognisable. Ooh. What did he get hit with? A cannonball? I don't know. But, oh, hang on. Was that the time when... That it exploded? Was he the one was king who was killed by his own cannon? I think so. Hold on. Let me open up Google. No, James II was killed right. by an exploding cannon. Yeah, his body was unrecognisable, leading to rumours that he hadn't died at all, but had gone to Jerusalem. <laughs> it's a bit like sent, <laughs> your guinea pig's gone to a farm or something. Yes. Isn't it? Your king's gone to Jerusalem. And there's some debate as to whether that was his body, because as we know, James wore that metal belt ever since he'd overthrown his oh, father. Yeah. And apparently the body that was sent to Catherine of Aragon didn't have the metal belt. So I suppose it's possible he might have been hit by something and the belt shattered or something, but I don't know. Hmm. What was assumed to be James's body was taken south to a monastery at Sheen. Presumably the same one that Perkin ran to after he jumped out of the window. Oh. Catherine of Aragon was all for sending the body to France as a lovely gift for the hubby. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> but the English hearts were too weak and she had to send him his cloak. That's right, his blooded cloak. <laughs> However, when Henry got home, there was this lovely corpse waiting for him since they hadn't been able to bury it. The Pope had told James, if you invade England, I'll excommunicate you. James did, so the Pope did. And oh. you can't bury the body of an no, excommunicated person. No, not until the excommunication has been lifted, if it ever gets lifted. So where did... What did they do with them? Um, well, that's, that's, that's quite a question. But Henry did seem to get special dispensation from the Pope to bury the body which Pope Leo X was happy to do, since apparently James had repented just before he died, which ah. seems logistically... Impossible. Highly unlikely, yes. Strangely, neither Margaret nor any of the nobles of Scot the Scottish nobility asked for the body back. I would have thought they might, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> He's her husband. Yes. Some say 
James was buried with full honours in St Paul's Cathedral because it doesn't do to defile the body of a king because it belittles kingship as a whole. True. But the other story about what happened to the body, he might have ended up being stored somewhere until Elizabeth's reign. Then he was found by a glazier who was doing some work about the place. And he was so taken by the sweet aroma of spices that was coming off the body, which I suppose is possible. I guess it was embalmed. It must have been because it had to wait to be buried. And it's been quite a while. Yes, that he did what any of us would do in those circumstances. He cut off his head and took it home. Oh, my. (laughs) Nobody should do that. (laughs) Ew. Whether it started to give him bad dreams or whether he felt a bit guilty, he then sent it to St. Michael's Church in Wood Street for burial. And we don't know what happened to the head. The church burnt down in the Great Fire of London. There's a pub there now, apparently. And we don't know what happened to the trunk. I mean, presumably it's still in that cupboard where the glacier had found it. Mm. So that was the end of the King of Scotland, the husband of Margaret Tudor. He was either buried in glory or dumped in a cupboard somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah. And that was where I intended to leave it for the first episode, because, you know, what would become of Margaret and little James? What would the relations be like between Margaret and Henry and Margaret and Catherine of Aragon? Yeah. Given that they had just killed her husband. Yeah. But if I stop it here, the two episodes, yeah, the, this, this one's episode extra be short. really long. <laughs> so okay. We'll carry on for a while. Yes, please. Following the news of her husband's death, news that she had been expecting... I mean, maybe the loss of so many family members makes you a little on the pessimistic side. Yeah. And she didn't think it was going to go well. What is that called? Being inured to loss? Yeah. I think she, she'd pleaded with him not to do it. Well, Margaret and little James moved to Stirling Castle. It was safer and more defendable. And then she wrote to Henry asking for peace for the sake of her son. Mm. Little James's coronation wasn't a very joyful affair. So many of the nobility being killed at Flodden that there can't have been anybody there who hadn't lost somebody. Did they actually do the coronation? He's baby. He is. He's 17 months old. Yeah. And it was known as the morning coronation. Not because it took place in the morning, because everybody was in morning. In morning. Yeah. Morning with a U. Then Margaret got on with the business of ruling. Her first proclamation was to prevent the looting of houses and the raping of women. Oh, goodness. Well, so many women have been left without husbands, sons, protectors. Right. And the second proclamation was that it was treason to deflower maidens or rob widows. And that's, they sound like good laws, but it also highlights the fact that these laws were thought to be necessary. Yeah. But what was going to happen between Scotland and England? Well, he- luckily, Henry had spent so much money in France that the last thing he wanted to do was carry on the war with Scotland. And Catherine sent a priest up to Scotland to comfort Margaret. You know, sorry we killed your husband. (laughs) Yeah. um, hmm. But he also brought a truce, which was probably more comfort to her. Okay. A peace treaty was confirmed for a year and a day while everyone thought what to do next. And either the priest or one of his party was actually sent up there as a spy by Henry VIII to work out a way in which young James V could be abducted and brought to the English court. This didn't happen, but the plans were there. Oh, God. (sighs) Meanwhile, the English and Scots were carrying out a mini-war in the marches, raiding and ravaging each other's land. And the people who suffered from this were not the nobles, but the defenceless no, peasants who had the yeah. misfortune to live on the border. At least 30 English towns were paying the Scottish Lord Hume protection money not to attack them. However, Margaret may have been desperate for peace for the sake of her little boy, but her council had different ideas. Of course they did. The son of the Duke of Al- Albany was hovering. His name was John Stuart. And he had a claim to the throne since James III had been his uncle. An envoy was sent to another quarter as well to ask for help. The King of Denmark himself. (laughs) (laughs) Hello. (laughs) There were rumours that Albany was bringing Danish troops as well as French ones, but I couldn't find out if that was any more than a rumour. There's a lot of rumours surrounding Denmark. (laughs) It was a hard choice for the councillors to make. If they chose Margaret as regent, there would be peace between England and Scotland. 
But there was a very real risk that Henry VIII would be pushing his sister aside and taking over. Right. And you know what? He totally would. Yeah. They were, they'd become subservient to England. If they chose Albany, France would give them money and arms, both of which they needed after Flodden. But then they'd be subservient to France. Yeah, and then war with England would be almost inevitable. Yeah, and they'd already lost. Well, for some, that was exactly what they wanted. They wanted revenge for the humiliation of Flodden. Really? Hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's not good, is it? No. You just, you just end up with more, more humiliation. Henry wrote to Margaret to say that if Albany did come to Scotland, the life of young James V would be in danger since Albany would be next in line for the throne. Right. And I don't know if anyone seriously thought this, but it was a good way for Henry to scare his sister yep. into vehemently opposing Albany's arrival. Yeah. Yeah. He'll kill your son. He will. I tell you, he will. Yeah. There's not much Margaret could do about it. He also has Richard III to point to. Yes, she. Yeah, she's not immune to that, that, that similarity, really. But it must have felt like a horrible deja vu to her, trying to persuade people that war was madness and only could end, end in disaster, because it did. The council had agreed that she should be regent, but that could easily be changed. Yeah. That had ensured a smooth transition. But nothing was set in stone. She was the king's sis king of England's sister. Could she really be trusted? And there was also that little item that she was a woman. <laughs> and there was no precedent for that, that sort of thing in Scotland. Oh, in Scotland. Oh, OK. I mean, maybe she was quite useful for pre presaging uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, saying, well, look, Margaret did it. Yeah. I'm just trying to remember the maid of Norway. Yeah, she died on the way here, didn't she? Yes, but she was going to be queen. So yeah. when, when was that, though? Yeah, but she wasn't regent without the king. True. That's that was the regent bit that yeah. was the problem. In March 1514, a council was held in Edinburgh. Margaret couldn't attend because she was eight months pregnant. So this meant they could discuss war without her wittering on about peace and her little boy all the time. You know, the best for the country. Yeah. Margaret was all well and good, but wouldn't the Duke of Albany be a better bet? Margaret called her new son Alexander, after James's eldest illegitimate son who died with him at Flodden, which is a nice gesture on Margaret's part. Yeah. Although Alexander was the name, it's the Scottish king's name as well, isn't there? There are quite a few yeah. Alexanders. She'd been away from the centre of power, and when she came back, there was change in the air. Uh-oh. The council had been toying with the idea of making her marry the King of France, the Duke what? of Albany. Can they do or that? Even, or even Emperor, <laughs> Emperor Maximilian. Oh, no. But can, yeah. can the council force that? I suppose they could use her being regent as, or her staying in power. You know, he won't get... Although she married the King of France, he's, he wasn't coming to Scotland, was he? No. <laughs> She'd be going to France. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. But when Margaret stood up in the council and told them they must all be as one, they seemed to have been completely won over and they agreed to sue for a longer peace. I can't help thinking there's more to it than that. Yeah. And they were adamant about war. Margaret stands up and says, united we stand, divided we fall. And then they all, they oh, all cave right. in. No. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe she brought a stick with her. I'm going to beat this at you. <laughs> it sounded too good to be true. In autumn 1514... Margaret married, none of the previous three, but Archibald Douglas, 6th Earl of Angus. But... Henceforth to be known as Angus. But the... Her regency depended on her not being married. Yes, it did. That's not a good idea. Well, perhaps that's probably why she married him in secret. Ah, uh, yeah, that's going to help. But she's also partly afraid of what her brother would say. I'm quite right, too, given Henry's reaction to Mary Tudor's marriage to Charles Brandon the following year. <laughs> Wait, does Henry think he has the right to tell her who to marry as well, still? I don't know. I mean, she's in a different country, but he, sh she hasn't got a husband. Well, she has now, but she didn't have a husband. Yeah. He is, I suppose, the family. I don't know. That's quite interesting, isn't it? I don't know. Because other... But she didn't, she didn't tell him. Other fathers have... 
reorganized or arranged a new marriage for their daughters. Hmm. Huh. I didn't... Yeah. When a contemporary Scottish historian said that Angus, quote, was very lusty in the sight of the Queen, unquote. But sadly, it seems he was made to court Margaret by his grandfather, who knew oh, a good thing no. when he saw it. So Margaret hadn't actually been wanted by either of her husbands so far. Oh, no, but she thinks she was. Hmm. Well, why did she marry him? Since, as we will see, she came to regret it bitterly. And he is the baddie I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. Uh-oh. I was completely baffled to start with as to why she'd done it. Early historians put it down to her lusty nature, so they're both accused of lustiness. <laughs> However, there were pragmatic reasons for her to choose Angus. For Margaret, marrying outside Scotland may be out of the question, because she would have lost any contact with her children. The two men who were next in line to the throne were already married, the first being the Duke of Albany. And she may have thought it would endear her to the Scottish lords if she married a Scotsman. But if she did think that, she should have checked her Scottish history because by favouring one powerful family over others, she made more enemies than she made friends. Angus presumably thought this would give him a cast iron link to the throne. And that was how Margaret saw it. She was adamant that Angus was now... Co Angus? Angus? Was, <laughs> Ang <laughs> she was adamant that Angus was now co-regent. Oh, oh, I'm sure the council liked that. No, no. The, Margaret was, was queen because she was the widow of the king. Yes. Now she wasn't. She was Mrs. Douglas. Yes. Under Scottish law, if a woman remarried, she gave up her rights to her children. What? Oh, my mm. God. I didn't know that. James V would still be king, but she would have no rights to him and she would not be regent. Oh, my God. Many in the council were putting Margaret aside. Margaret must have got some sort of inkling of what sort of man she'd married when Angus demanded that the Archbishop of Glasgow hand over the Great Seal to him so that he could get on with being regent. The Archbishop refused to do this because it was still up in the air as to who was going to be regent. So Angus chased him to Fife, arrested him and violently took the seal off him. So many blamed Margaret, implying that she'd put him up to attacking the Archbishop. But you just don't beat up Archbishops. I mean, it's just not done. Yeah. And this could have been one of the reasons why, on the 26th of August, Margaret was called before the council and told to hand her authority to the Duke of Albany, her cousin. Well, the, the son of her husband's uncle. Cousin. <laughs> <laughs> His father was the one who tried to coup with the help of the English crown in the form of Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and Henry Percy, and, to some extent, Francis Lovell. So the father had had the help of the English, but now the tables were turned. Henry VIII was on team Margaret, for obvious reasons. He thought he could manipulate his sister, whereas Albany had been living in France all these years. And the council was adamant and called Albany over to be regent. But Albany said, no. No oh, good. <laughs> I see how disastrous this is. No, <laughs> I'm not doing this. Well, it wasn't that. He was annoyed that his dad still carried the slur of traitor by the Scottish and he oh. wanted that taint to be moved before he came to Scotland. And they said no. Uh, they must have done it. They must have done it because he does come over. Oh. Margaret fought back in any way she knew how. She called her own meeting of the council, calling anyone who's loyal to her to attend but the real council forbade any, of the, forbade any of their members from attending. Margaret then upset everyone by making one of her new husband's relatives the Bishop of St Andrews. <sighs> and the previous incumbent had been Alexander, the oldest, the, her old husband's... Old, oldest. Her old husband's oldest illegitimate son. So this was looking as if she was favouring her new family over her old. Oh. And seemed like a bit of a slap in the face for James IV. Yeah even though Alexander was dead. This led to a siege of the seat of the Archbishopric, St Andrew's Castle, with a battle between two of the potential incumbents. <laughs> Margaret complained to her brother that she was paying £1,000 to protect Stirling, where she was, and to protect the Bishop of St Andrew's, and she was rapidly getting through her money, and could Henry kindly send an army by land and sea before it was too late? Hmm. 
I'm not sure whether at this point Henry had considered sending an army or whether that was just that Margaret assumed that that was what he was going to do. She does seem to be asking a lot of her brother. Send an army to get me back as regent. Your army should also get back St Andrew's Castle. Also stop Albany from reaching Scotland. Oh, and would you talk to the Pope, that's Leo X, the Medici Pope, telling him to favour her husband's uncle as the Archbishop? <laughs> that's quite a to-do list. Yes, do this, do this, do this, do this, do yes. this. But I'm not going to do anything for you. No. Did she have her inheritance by now? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But you do get the feeling that she's in a complete panic as if she's sort of... Oh, my God! ...dictating as she runs around the room going, yes, <laughs> But it was signed, your loving sister, Margaret R. And that was proof it was genuine. If it had just said Margaret R, Henry would know it was a forgery. Oh. What a foolproof method, I no. thought. But, but uh, it's worth remembering. Now, fortunately for Margaret, if Henry had any intention of sending troops to help her, he changed her mind. Their sister Mary had married Louis XII, who had since died... So now Henry was keen to keep the peace with France and make friends with the new king, Francis I. He was not going to jeopardise it by turning on the Duke of Albany, who had the backing of France. Right. Even if it did mean leaving his sister high and dry. When England warred with France, Henry didn't have the resources to help Margaret. When England and France had good relations, he couldn't help Margaret for fear of offending the Scots and therefore the French. I'm not sure she ever understood this. (laughs) In either circumstances, she was going to lose out. Would she care? Honestly, would she care? Ultimately, you're leaving her high and dry no matter what. She wants to be regent. And I don't think it's it's not a bid for power. It's the only way she can keep her children. Right. That it always seems to be the primary issue with right. Margaret. Right. Henry was not entirely turning his back on his sister. He had a plan. Margaret should come home back to England and bring her two boys, James and Alexander, with her. Oh, like the council would ever let that happen. Well, no. James should then become Henry's heir as the King of England. Oh. Alexander should become the King of Scotland. And how different things would have been if that scheme had worked out. No kidding. Yeah. No Mary, no Elizabeth. Hmm. But Margaret was adamant that young James was the King of Scotland. So she delicately put Henry off. She told him that there were spies everywhere. Quote, if I were such a woman that might go with my bairn in mine arm, I trow I should not be long from you. Unquote. I like she picked up the Scottish lingo with a bairn bit. But... Yeah. <laughs> her English counsellors were advising her to follow Henry's plans, but she was convinced, probably rightly, that if she left Scotland with the boys... That would entirely scupper young James and Alexander's chances for the Scottish crown since they'd both be labelled as rebels. Right. Yeah. Also, wouldn't the Scots just put Albany on the throne instead? He was next in line. Oh. So instead instead of being regent, he'd be king. Yeah. Because if James went to England, it could be said that he'd abdicated. Yeah. Henry sent his good friend Charles Brandon to France to negotiate with Francis about keeping Albany in France. Apparently, Princess Princess Mary asked Brandon to ensure the safety of her sisters and boys. So a nice bit of sisterly love there. (laughs) But Francis I had already told Albany he could go and he wasn't going to go back on his word. So Albany left for Scotland in April and arrived on the 18th of May. And he was greeted by Lord Hume and his 10,000 men. And he was the one one who'd been running that protection racket on the border. Yeah. And Hume had been Margaret's deadly enemy. Oh, dear. But Albany made some condescending comment to him on his arrival in Edinburgh. And Hume immediately switched sides. I'm not going to be spoken to like that. So he's now team Margaret. Oh, pride. Yes. I don't know what... what, um, Albany said to him, but Hume wasn't having it. Okay. (laughs) Margaret moved to Edinburgh Castle so that Albany could have her apartments at Holyrood. Oh. She dressed in red velvet, so looking very queenly, she greeted Albany cordially in French and said that she, she hoped he'd enjoy his stay in Scotland. 
not when it says you greet someone who's spending a fortnight there, really, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I really hope you have a nice time and then go. <laughs> She had hoped that even if Albany were regent, she'd be able to work with him as mother of the king. Their first clash occurred when Albany imprisoned some people that Margaret had spoken up for. Uh-oh. And it became obvious that her opinions were not going to count for very much. On the 12th of July, Albany was confirmed as regent and it was Margaret's husband, Angus, who placed the coronet on his head. Oh! So... I don't think it's it's not Angus turning against Margaret. It's them. Ex- you know, this is this is a fait accompli now. He's here. We got to make it work somehow. We've yeah. got to get an in so we have some sort of say. Yeah. 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 Albany nominated eight nobles to look after Margaret's son and said that she could choose four of them. So nominally, she had a choice. Okay. They'll be ignored, but you get. Or there were four, and she could choose three, depending on which book you read. Okay. But she didn't trust him. She moved to Stirling Castle, which was well fortified. She was now six months pregnant with her child with Angus. The designated nobles turned up on Margaret's doorstep, but instead of handing the boys over, she lowered the portcullis and told the nobles that James IV had entrusted their children to her, and so she had no right to hand them over to anyone else. Well, he had, but only while she remained a widow. Yeah, that's... Mm. She she very conveniently forgets that bit most of the time. Every time. Okay. Yeah. But then they're her kids. They're her children. They're her children. Yeah. But she asked for a few days before she gave them her final answer. Because she was hoping for help from her husband or from Henry VIII. Well, good luck with that. Yeah, she's going to be disappointed over and over and over again. She really is. Angus is furious with her because she thought that this resistance would lead him to being accused of treason. So he was spending all his time saying, it's nothing to do with me. Oh, so he's not... Oh, he's not even... And, yeah, as you said before, Margaret must have had in her hand the memory of what happened to Edward IV's young lads after Elizabeth Woodville had handed them over. Mm-hmm. When a powerful leader asks you to hand over two boys, just say, say no. no. Absolutely <laughs> not. Yeah. In fact, her knight in shining armour was Lord Hume, who had been her enemy. Really? Until Albany snubbed him. Ah, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) He had a plan. He and Lord Dacre, who was the go-between between between Margaret and Henry, would rescue Margaret and the boys and smuggle them over the border. Now, this is quite an odd alliance, since it had been the Scottish Hume and the English Dacre who'd been responsible for all that tit-for-tat raiding across the border. Yeah. Hume was going to get the boys out of Stirling Castle by burning down a town nearby. Oh, goodness. That's a great plan. What the (laughs) heck? Yeah. It's using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, I would have thought. But that would draw the garrison away from the castle. Anyway, what could possibly go wrong? Loads. Everything, everything went wrong and the garrison didn't move. I'm not sure if they burnt the car, the town down and the, the garrison just stood on the top and looked at it and thought, oh, well, that's a pity. <laughs> <laughs> Glad we're not there. <laughs> so Margaret had no choice but to give up the boys. This decision became inevitable when heavy artillery arrived outside the walls. Little James was just three. Alexander must have been a toddler. Margaret dressed James up and put a crown on his little head before taking him out to meet Albany. Albany knelt before the boy. Margaret tried to put in a good word for her husband, who, since he'd been previously campaigning against Albany, was considered a traitor. But Albany said he would swear loyalty to Margaret and the boys, but no way was he going to swear loyalty to Angus. No. Margaret was led away to Edinburgh, leaving the boys at Stirling Castle. And it must have been a heart-wrenching scene. She was assured that she'd have access to her children, but she couldn't. She couldn't be sure about it. No. And to cap it all, Henry was fuming with her. Why had she handed over the boys without a fight? What? And she pointed out that she would have fought if she'd had some help from her brother. Yeah. Albany told Margaret to write to her brother to tell him that she was happy with the arrangement with the boys and Albany, which she did, and she signed the letter Margaret R., Ah. 
Not giving up that easily. No. Margaret decided that the only way she could get Henry to help her was to go to England and ask him face to face, even if it did mean leaving her sons with Albany for the time being. Lord Dacre hatched a plan. Margaret was to ride to Linlithgow as if she were going into her confinement because she was now eight months pregnant. I'm assuming Linlithgow is farther south? Yeah, I think it is okay. fairly close to the border, I'm, okay. gu I'm guessing. But instead, she should ride secretly to Blackadder. And this plan worked and Margaret was soon safely and secretly hidden at Blackadder. <laughs> then she got a letter from Albany pretty much addressed to Margaret currently hiding from me, supposedly secretly, at Blackout. <laughs> <laughs> he asked her to come back and let's sort something out with the kids. She'd get her dower rents and everything would be lovely. She was very tempted because she was short of money. Yeah. But Dacre told her that Albany was busy amassing troops to lay siege to Blackadder. And in a panic, Margaret rode with him to Berwick, which was a pity since Dacre had just told an out-and-out -out lie. Oh. The worry about her boys must have got the better of her since she then wrote to Albany. Albany sent the French ambassador to Berwick to talk to her. But by the time he arrived, Margaret had moved on. Mm. On the way to Dacre's residence in Morpeth Castle, so we're in England now, Margaret's labour pains began uh -oh. and they had to stop at Harbottle Castle. Oh, still a castle. Well, they hadn't been expecting a royal visit, especially one that was going to involve the delivery of a child. It was more of a grim fortress. Uh-oh. Lord Dacre only let Margaret through and none of her Scottish revenues. Even Angus was left outside. So he was part of this deal to... Oh. Well, I tell you, actually, there were, I had two versions of this. I, Angus either stayed behind or he was with, with them, but it seemed more likely that he came too. He could come in, he was told, if he swore loyalty to Henry VIII. And Angus said, no, no, thank you. No. But Margaret was delivered safely of a little girl, also called Margaret, after a 48-hour labour. And Mother Margaret then suffered excruciating sciatica, which made her scream with pain. And all the time, the fortress was being attacked by Scottish raiders. A few nights outside the walls with the raiders made Angus rethink his decision. And he agreed to swear loyalty to Henry. <laughs> Let me in, I'll sign anything. Please, I'm going to die. <laughs> a letter was sent in Margaret's name by Dacre to Albany. And I'm not sure whether Margaret had told him what to write and he just did the transcribing or maybe she knew nothing about it and Dacre just took it upon himself to forge a letter from her. The letter asked for the regentship of the boys and the governance of Scotland, and it outlined all the grievances that Margaret had suffered at Albany's hands. Albany replied, quote, We cannot consent that you should have tutory of the king's grace and his brother, nor the governance of the realm, unquote. So if Margaret had ever had any possibility of becoming regents for her son, she'd just blown it by fleeing the country. Mm. Dacre was desperate to get Margaret down to London because it wasn't safe for them to be so close to the border. But Margaret was still in a lot of pain and could hardly be expected to travel all that way. And she also may have been suffering from typhus at this point. Okay. Henry and Catherine of Aragon sent her 22 dresses. Why would she need 22 dresses? I have no idea. Yeah, some penicillin or something might do the trick but 22 dresses yes and they're a doctor <laughs> even though they're not really and margaret said rather plaintive rather plaintively quote lo my lord here you may see that the king my brother hath not forgotten me unquote oh I sent you 22 dresses by the time they reached morpeth margaret was very ill mm. back in scotland her son alexander had died this feels like she's going to die, but she can't. Did you just say her, her son died? Her son Alexander? Alexander died, but they decided not to tell her. Oh, God. Albany was offering Margaret all the rights that had, been, that had not been forfeited by her marriage to Angus and seemed mystified by her flight, but it was those very rights that had been forfeited by her marriage that she was fighting for. Yeah. Even though she didn't actually have any right to them. When Margaret was told about Alexander's death, she sent out proclamations accusing Albany of murdering her child and likening him to Rich III. Mm. Her husband had returned to Edinburgh and made his peace with Albany. 
What Margaret didn't know was that he also returned to the woman he'd wanted to marry before he was made to marry Margaret. Oh, no. This poor woman. A lot of the women that we talk about have such a horrible life. It's really piling it on, isn't it? Yeah. And it was all a little bit miserable for Margaret, especially since she was still suffering from typhus when he decided to abandon her and go home. Oh, God. When Henry heard about it, he said, quote, done as a Scot, unquote. <gasps> uh, yeah. From April, she began the long, slow journey south. She met Henry for the first time in 13 years. And then in London, she met Catherine of Aragon and Mary, her sister, who'd recently returned from France. And I wonder how much Margaret knew of Catherine's plan to send her body of her husband over to France. Yeah. Henry had given Margaret's second husband, Angus, the right to come to the English court, but he preferred to stay in Scotland. Wonder why. With the woman, yeah. Mm. yeah. And this is where we'll leave Margaret for this week. She's at home with her family at last, apart from her husband and her children. But So hopefully she'll have a, a nice time at the English court being fated by her sister, sister-in-law, brother, hmm. while her useless husband, her awful, awful husband, which we'll see next time how awful he is, stays in Scotland. Really? He's worse than what he's already done? He's terrible. Absolutely okay. awful man. Yeah, sorry, that ended on quite a yes. downer. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. You know, we all have this idea that being a princess is lovely. It really is not. No, it's really pretty grim, isn't it? Yeah. Have we have we come across a happy princess? Not Juana. No. Nope. Catherine of Aragon in the middle nope. bit, I suppose. For a little but while. Not, not later, yeah. Mm. No. Uh, Mary didn't want to marry Louis. No. He's old and gouty. Yes. Hmm. No, she was a happy princess afterwards, but that's because she didn't marry a prince or anything. She married a, yeah. <laughs> a normal person. Yes. Somebody she actually loved and knew. Yeah. Hmm. OK, well, I'm sorry to leave it on that rather down. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time for Margaret Part 2. OK, next week. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye.